Hi, good morning. Um, welcome to the Lifestyle Medical and Brand New Day webinar. Today, uh, Dr. Topeka uh, Pandit will be educating us all on sleep. And who doesn't want better sleep, right? My name is Shana Popkin, Director of Sales with Brand New Day. And Dr. Pandit believes in building a healthy lifestyle that empowers you to heal, not just prescribing the next pill. She completed her medical uh, school and residency at Loma Linda University. And in Lifestyle Medical are two locations, one in Riverside and one in Redlands. Brand New Day is a Medicare Advantage plan in 12 counties, and we have nearly 50,000 members. We're excited to partner with Lifestyle Medical and support their patients. Uh, we have extra benefits like dental, vision, hearing, transportation, over-the-counter allowance, and more. Uh, and just a quick note for the webinar, uh, we have a chat room and a Q&A section in the chat room that will be um, public and in the Q&A, you can post anonymous questions and they'll be answered. Uh, so with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Pandit. Hi, good morning, everybody. I wish I could hear you, but that's okay. We're just gonna have a good time talking about how to really improve our lives, how to feel much better. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Let's get right in. I do work at a primary care private practice. Um, so just wanted to let you know about that. If you are interested, we're gonna be talking about it in, at the end of the presentation. But the agenda for today, we're gonna to be talking about just a couple stories initially. And then we're gonna talk about the pandemic and how it has really affected so many of our sleep and in turn, our overall health in general, our, our physical health and mental health, social health, so many different aspects are affected. And the big part of the today's presentation is tips to actually help you sleep better, to have a huge impact. So we're gonna be talking about some seven small, simple things that you can do to really help you sleep better. So let's start off with a story. Rick is a gentleman, a middle-aged gentleman who comes to our clinic and particularly to our groups. And his name has been changed for protection and privacy. Uh, but he sleeps about five hours a night. So he was kind of mentioning how he was having trouble sleeping during the group. And we were, I was just throwing out some ideas to say, maybe try you know, little things just a few little things here, increase your exercise, expose yourself to a little bit more light during the day. Um, then we talked about having a warm bath maybe to before you go to bed because the physiology behind that is that your core body temperature needs to be low when you're trying to go to sleep, which means if your extremities are actually warm, your hands and feet are warm, it aids in the process of your core temperature being low. And so we talked about how having a warm bath could help with increasing the temperature of, the, of your periphery, your hands and feet, so that it helps the, the core temperature to drop. And other ideas of maybe some people needed to put some socks on their feet to help with warming their feet. So we talked about those little things. Um, and he mentioned that he was having some trouble, trouble falling asleep, not necessarily staying asleep. So the next time we actually got onto group, I asked him how he was doing and he actually mentioned he was doing much better. And so I said, what helped? And he said, you know, it was the warm bath. And I think it was my surprise that kind of shocked me overall because I was surprised. And we know that little simple things can actually make a big difference, but for some reason, you know, because we don't have large scale studies, it's not, we don't have a lot of randomized control studies and little things like this. Um, it is still such a pleasant surprise to me and such a wonderful surprise. Every time I hear that something as simple as that can make such a big difference. And he was just so happy about that. So I wanted to share that story. Um, and then the second story is my own. Um, ever since I've been a little kid, I was told that I was a worry wart and I always worried about everything and anything. And, um, and it never really bothered me as far as 
my sleep or my health. And just a few years ago, I noticed that it started to affect my sleep. And I'm not sure if it was just that or a bunch of other things. But I started to experiment for myself. And I started to see, let me try little different things. Um, these specific lifestyle things that I knew about, I tried to put into practice. So these are the things that I started off. I started, started putting some soft music on and I noticed a huge difference. I'm extremely attracted to music, helps to calm me down. Um, I started doing some deep breathing and relaxing my muscles, particularly when I was breathing. And along with the breathing, I would started to do some self-talk and I would tell myself, now is not the time to worry. Now is the time to sleep. You don't have to worry all day and all night. If you want to, you can worry tomorrow morning, but not tonight, because right now is your time to sleep. So I would tell myself these things, you know, everything is going to be okay. And I noticed that that helped, that actually helped too. And a warm bath was really helpful for me too. Spirituality was one of the big things that, that helped make a big difference, and it still does. Um, it's something I still have to practice, but when I allow myself to let go of my worries to a higher power, realizing that I am not in control of things and, and the higher power, a loving higher power, in my case, God, is in control of things and I can trust God to, to take care of things properly for me. That makes a big difference for me to help me to sleep. Exercise, I noticed, made a big difference when I when I started exercising during the daytime, I actually slept better. My deep, my sleep was deeper. Um, and then more recently, I've been struggling with some nasal congestion. So with allergies, I'm sure a lot of people are struggling with that. Um, and when you wake up in the morning or in the middle of the night with a clogged nose, you know you're not getting enough air in. So there, that could be one reason why you're not sleeping well as well. So just dealing with nasal congestion can make a big difference. The key point with these two main stories I want to make is that sleeping better doesn't have to be complicated. It can be a few simple things that really make a big difference. So how does this pandemic that we are all going through really affecting us and our sleep in particular? Well, it's disrupted our normal life, our routine. And in order for our bodies and our minds to sleep good, we need routine. Um, so disruption of our routine life is because we're having to distance from other people. Our schools are closed. We're in quarantine. We're staying home more. Uh, we're working from home more now instead of actually having to go to work, unable to even go to the grocery stores. Um, a lot of our normal routines are just so different now, and it takes a lot of adjusting to that. And so, of course, our sleep is going to be affected. Um, also, adjusting to different types of schedules means greater stress. There are kids at home now that, that we have to deal with. Vacations are canceled. There's stress at work trying to figure out how to do Zoom meetings. Um, so stress by itself can also affect your sleep. And along with all of the stress comes some anxiety and worry. We're worried about getting the virus ourselves. We're worried about our loved ones getting it, worried about finances, how are we gonna make it? We're uncertain of the future, have no idea what, what this world is gonna turn out eventually. So a lack of control really in our lives and that really creates a lot of anxiety and worry which can affect sleep. And that can lead to depression and isolation. So when we don't have our normal coping mechanisms of being able to hug people we love, being able to go on trips, go shopping, going to a restaurant and eating, uh, we, it's easy to get depressed and depression and isolation can also affect sleep. And then when we're depressed, we wanna go for comforting things like comfort foods and we have less motivation to exercise. We have less exposure to outside light because we're not spending as much time outside. And those particular things also affect sleep. Less exercise, less exposure to outdoor light. And we're spending excess time on, on the screens. So we're spending time on screens for 
work, Zoom meetings, even social time is on screens. We're bored, so we're watching TV or we're on our phones. And screen time and light can also affect our sleep. Um, so understanding how this pandemic is actually affecting our sleep can help us come up with ways to tackle it. Sleep and disease. We all know that sleep, a lack of sleep can actually affect the way you feel. And it's also associated with all of these medical conditions here. I'm just going to highlight a couple. Uh, the immune system is the most important one that I wanted to highlight because we are going through a pandemic. And so if you're sleeping particularly less than seven hours every night consistently, your immune system can be affected. And if you are sleeping an adequate amount, it actually boosts your immune system because you create natural cytokines that help you to fight inflammation. If you don't sleep enough, your emotional health is affected, your relationships are affected, mental functions, you can't learn, memorize properly, you're irritable and cranky. Um, you, it can be similar to drinking alcohol. So if you are, have been sleep deprived for, for 20 hours, so if you've been awake for 20 hours consistently, it's similar to having an alcohol level of 0.08%, which is basically the legal limit in California. And if you are awake longer than that, then it's similar to having a higher level of alcohol. So there are other medical conditions that I've listed here as well that you can see are affected if you don't get enough sleep. So how much sleep do you actually need? The goal I would recommend seven to eight hours per night for adults, even if you're sleeping more than that, that's a problem too, and that needs to be looked into. So adequately, you ideally you wanna shoot for about seven to eight hours. It's not just the quantity, but also the quality that's important. So how do you feel when you wake up in the morning? Are you refreshed or not? How did you wake up during the middle of the night? That's important too. So let's launch into the important parts here, the tips for better sleep. Here are the seven main tips and then we're gonna talk about each of them in more detail. Number one, set your schedule and a comfort routine for you to calm down before you go to bed. Two, reserve the bed for sleep and sex only to have positive associations with your bed. Three, monitor your exposure to light. So we're gonna be talking about blue light specifically and outdoor light. Four, stay active. Circulation is huge for sleep. Five, practice kindness and gratitude, foster connection. So the emotions that you allow yourself to experience um, affects your life and health in general, but also sleep. Six, use relaxation techniques to help your mind and body calm down before you go to sleep. And seven, watch what you eat and drink. So we're gonna talk about all those. The schedule and comfort routine. A comfort routine or ritual is wind down time before you go to bed that I recommend for everybody. Again, the body loves routine. So I usually say about an hour before you go to bed, some do some things, create a routine for yourself that you know helps calm you down. You could journal about your feelings. And sometimes people will have a worry journal where they write down their worries if that's keeping them from sleeping. Or you can have a gratitude journal where you write down all the things that you're thankful for to create positive emotions. You can do some light reading by soft light, probably nothing that will get your, get your emotions all hyped up. Um, you can put some soft, calming music, light some candles, some really gentle scents like lavender. We talked about taking a warm bath and the physiology of that. Deep breathing, positive self-talk, just telling yourself now is the time to wind down, go to bed. So whatever it is that you need for your comfort ritual or routine, you can start doing that about an hour before you go to bed. And also during that time, stop using uh, any sort of blue light or screens, and we'll talk about that more. Go to sleep and wake up around the same time every day. So again, that goes along with the routine that our bodies and minds love. And if you go to, if you wake up in the morning around the same time and then you go to bed around the same time, your body ends up doing a lot of the work for you. So you won't necessarily have to force yourself to do it. 
because your body gets in that routine and it will naturally start to wind down around the time that you need to go to bed. Keep your bedroom cool, dark, and quiet. Cool is actually between 60 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit. So especially in the hot summer months here, that can be difficult. Um, so that is an important part. Dark, nothing more than a, a nightlight. And quiet is either completely quiet or something like a white noise, like a fan or something like that. And then during the pandemic, because it's difficult to actually feel like you have a schedule, it's important to still have that feeling, that, that ability to separate times for when you, when you do things. So when you get up in the morning, shower and dress or do your normal routine like you are going to work if you need to, whether you leave the house or not. So staying in your pajamas all day is going to really confuse your body. Eat meals at the same time each day. Um, block off a specific time period for work, specific time period for exercise, specific time periods for social time. So again, your body gets used to that routine. I'm sure there would be a question about naps. So if you nap too much during the day, it throws off your circadian rhythm. Um, so I recommend usually if you do need to take a nap to limit it to a short nap, maybe in the afternoon between 10 to 30 minutes and probably not longer than that and not close to your bedtime because then you'll really be awake at night. So reserving the bed for sleep and sex only. That means no working in bed. So you, if you take your laptop to bed, your mind and body is in a state of, of heightened awareness and needing to work. And so your bed is gonna be associated with that. You know, watching TV in bed or anything else that's that can be stimulating. Associate your bed with relaxing. And I may even extend that to say associate your bedroom if possible. So all other types of activities, you may need to do it outside of your bedroom. Exposure to light. So blue light is something that is emitted by screens like our TVs, computers, um, cell phones, laptops, they all emit blue light that can actually mess with the hormone melatonin in our brains that actually helps us go to sleep. So it will keep us up if you are exposed to blue light. So an hour before you go to bed, when you're going to start your comfort routine, it's a good idea to either turn off screens or just put those devices away. The other important part about light is to, to, to allow yourself to be exposed to outdoor life for 30 minutes every day. And now that's a problem because we're being told to stay at home inside. And so we're not really spending that much time outside. But in order for our circadian rhythms to work well, we actually need to be exposed to, to light that is outdoors. That 10,000 lux um, is what you need. Indoor lighting normally is about 300 to 500 lux, which is extremely low. The brightest industrial lighting inside is about 1,500 lux. So on outside, when you go on maybe a um, shady day is close to 10,000 lux. On a bright sunny day is about 100,000 lux. So it's better for you to go outside even on an overcast cloudy day than it is for you to stay inside in bright lighting all day. Open your windows and blinds to let some light in if you're going to be inside as well. Staying active. So circulation is one of the big things we talked about as far as warm baths and the importance of your core temperature cooling down. If you have a lot of circulation and volume of liquid and fluids in your body, through circulation, then it makes it easier for the body to regulate the temperature so you can sleep. So when you exercise, you release a chemical called adenosine and that when released during the daytime is actually really helpful for you to have deeper sleep at night. So they have found that early morning is the best time for exercise. You can do exercise now even inside if you're staying at home but even if you're quarantining, you can potentially still go outside 
um, if you don't have any symptoms of, of COVID or, or any other viruses, if you're not sick, you can still go outside and social distance while you're outside. So you can go to parks um, or walk around your neighborhood still wearing a mask. Even a moderate walk, a moderate paced walk is good enough to get enough exercise and circulation. But if you choose, you, you have choices of also doing things inside. There are gyms and other studios and dance classes that are offering free live streaming classes. There are YouTube videos that you can look up to help you follow along, you know, with these with these exercises. And you can do them with your family, your friends that, that you that you live with to make it more fun. You might want to avoid vigorous exercise before right before you go to bed about two hours because vigorous exercise will actually increase your core body temperature and then it takes at least a couple hours for that to start to cool down. So choose some quieter, quieter activities after, after dinner to kind of help you wind down. Practicing kindness and gratitude and fostering connection is important as far as creating positive emotions and, and those kinds of associations in your body. Your mind needs to be relaxed before you go to bed too. This is one of the huge things that I see and hear about in, in clinic. People say, I have a racing mind. I just, I just can't stop thinking. I just can't stop worried about this and this. And um, so that, that creates more of a, a stressful mind and body situation. And when you practice kindness and feelings of just thankfulness, you are calming down those kind of systems in your body and helps your mind to relax so you can go to sleep. I love this quote from Mr. Rogers, from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Um, he said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. And we know that when you practice this kindness or you see someone else being kind to someone else, it has physiologic changes in your body that is actually protective for you in, in your disease state and, and also to help you sleep. So these positive emotions are things that you can actually create a habit and practice. Relaxation techniques, there are several different ones. I've uh, mentioned some here, deep breathing. The way that I usually recommend people do that is taking a deep breath in for about four seconds, filling your lungs completely, because most of us don't allow ourselves to fill our lungs completely. Um, and then hold it for a couple seconds and slowly breathe out through your mouth. And while you're breathing out, purposely relax the muscles in your body. You can do them all at once or you can do it part by part. So you can say, well, I'm breathing out this time, focus on the muscles in my head and relax them. Then the next time the muscles in my face and relax, shoulders and relax, etc. So that makes, that's called progressive muscle relaxation. And that actually trains your body to relax. Um, our nervous system is mostly divided into two different sets. And we've got the sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight or flight response. And that's when we are rearing, ready to go. If we see a bear, we are ready to run. You know, our whole body is prepared to act. And then the other part of our nervous system is the parasympathetic. And that's the part that says, I'm just going to relax right now and take things easy. And your body is in a state where you're probably gonna have a hard time gearing up and ready to run when you see a bear, but that is the state of, that your body and mind needs to be in for you to go to sleep. And that actually has huge benefits when you allow your body to be that way. So these types of relaxation techniques fosters that parasympathetic nervous system to be active so that you're actually relaxing. Yoga is one of the big things to help you relax, uh, calming music, quiet reading. We talked about self-talk. Um, bad news is one of the big things right now that people have trouble with because it's everywhere. So exposing yourself to bad news is going to hike up that sympathetic nervous system. So some practical tips, 
If you need to watch the news, limit your news sites, pick maybe one or two, either websites or news channels or whatever, and then limit the time that you're actually going to watch or read that so that you're not exposing yourself too much to that. And then social media too, bad news is everywhere on social media. So monitor your time on that. There may be specific apps or ways to monitor your social media that can help you limit how much time, make you more aware of how much time that you're spending on social media. And then and schedule a visit with family and friends to talk about things other than bad news. Talk about actually good things. Force yourself to or practice experiences that really allow you to still have fun and enjoy life, even in this stressful environment. If it's playing with your dog or your kids or, um, or watching something that's really lighthearted there is still fun that we can have now and and we have to actually gear our minds and our bodies to to feel and experience that instead of the bad news all the time and the last tip is what you eat or drink so whole plant foods is usually what we recommend for a healthy habit in general these are the foods that your body likes and works the best with and decreases inflammation in your body and really protects you from disease. So these include high fiber vegetables, fruits, um, legumes like beans and lentils, etc., whole grains instead of refined grains. So that's brown rice instead of white rice, whole grain bread instead of white bread. And these types of foods particularly help to, to restore and protect the good bacteria in your gut. You may have heard of the gut-brain connection. And that is that a lot of the neurotransmitters that your brain uses to help you function, things like serotonin and dopamine, which are feel-good hormones. There's the GABA, which is the calming hormone. Um, and then there is melatonin, which is the one that helps you sleep. These types of neurotransmitters are actually produced in your gut by the good bacteria in your gut. And so you want to be able to, to feed these good bacteria and protect them. And these types of foods particularly will help to protect these, these good bacteria. You might want to avoid caffeine after 2 p.m. and some places will say afternoon. You can decide what how your body responds to it. Caffeine is a stimulant, so it will keep you up. Um, and it will also dehydrate you. So we know that we've talked about circulation and the importance of that to help you sleep. Um, alcohol, you might want to avoid within three hours of going to sleep. A lot of people will say, one glass of wine is just really helpful for me to just relax and go to bed. And that's true that it can actually help you relax and wind down initially, but eventually it will, it will turn into a stimulant, maybe even in the middle of the night and your quality of sleep will not be good. And alcohol also tends to dehydrate. So again, there's that aspect. So staying hydrated, like we talked about is, is important. So drinking water during the daytime and keeping yourself hydrated during the daytime is helpful for you to sleep at night. You might wanna make sure that you drink lots of water up to about an hour before you go to bed. So then you're not having to wake up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. So staying hydrated during the day with water or herbal teas can be helpful. And uh, as far as your meals, I would probably say even three to four hours before you go to, go go to bed is when you should probably eat your last meal. So your stomach is not um, constantly digesting and working while your body is trying to process and make you feel better. So here's the summary of setting your schedule and comfort routines, how that can help you sleep, creating positive associations with your bed and your bedroom as a relaxing place for you, monitor your exposing your exposure to light limiting blue light and increasing your exposure to outdoor light 
staying active so you're getting circulation in your body, practicing positive emotions and experiences like being uh, kind and gentle with other people, practicing gratitude and creating connection with others, using relaxation techniques like um, meditation or yoga or even deep breathing can be helpful for you to relax before going to bed. And what you eat and drink does make a big difference to how you sleep. So I hope you've realized that that there are these simple things that can actually make a huge difference uh, for, for how you sleep. And, and hopefully, once you give your body the right environment so that it actually can get a good night's sleep, you'll be amazed at what your body and mind can do while you sleep to re really renew, rejuvenate and, and restore you. I hope this has been helpful. And... Um, Thank you so much for coming and, and being able to be a part of this. I will turn it over. I will turn it over to whoever needs to be leading out the next part of the of this webinar. Questions before I wrap it up? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, let's do that first. All right, so we've got some questions and answers. Okay. Thank you for, for these questions. Um, we'll see how much we can get to. Hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them. But let's see, would a warm foot bath with Epsom salts and lavender and essential oil help in lieu of a warm bath before bed? Yes, absolutely. A warm foot bath can also help uh, to help the the extremities. The extremities become warmer, and the lavender will help calm your whole body down in general. So yes, that's a wonderful idea. Next question: When I get a full seven to eight hours of sleep, I still feel tired during the day. Why is that? I'm sure there's many people that that are going through this. That's a, that's a great question. So that probably has to do with your quality of sleep. And there are many things that can affect the quality of sleep. I would be interested to see if you start putting into action some of these tips that we just talked about, whether your quality of sleep will improve with just that. The one thing I'd probably start off with is exercise, making sure you're getting enough exercise during the daytime because that adenosine from the exercise helps with deeper sleep. Next question, I want to work out in the evening. Does this affect sleep? Great question. We talked about heavy exercise that you might want to avoid that a couple hours before you go to bed, maybe even longer. Um, the reason for that is because heavy exercise can increase the core body temperature. And it then after the exercise, it takes at least two to three hours for your core body temperature to start to decrease and you need a low core body temperature to sleep. So if possible, you could either split your exercise time, do some in the morning, do some in the evening, or just try to manage your time so that you're keeping about three hours before bedtime, two to three hours before bedtime, um, so that you exercise during that time. Or you can, if there's a way for you to get all of your exercise in the morning, that's actually the best, the, the ideal. Next question, are there any foods or drinks I can have before bed that will help me fall asleep? Yes, there are certain types of teas that can particularly help with calming you down. So chamomile tea is one of the one of the things that I that I can usually recommend. And it's an herb that it can actually help you, that helps to relax your body. You can try that either in conjunction with all of the tips that we just mentioned, or you can do, you can just do just the tips and then seeing if that by itself can be helpful. If that's really not helping, then you can try the chamomile tea as well. 
Next question. What are your thoughts about falling asleep with the TV on? I am not a big fan of that. We talked about the blue light and so even screens and stimulation from TV can may help you fall asleep initially, but I doubt it will really help you have a deep sleep and a good quality of sleep. So um, I don't recommend falling asleep with the TV on. Sometimes I get a full eight hours of sleep and still wake up feeling groggy. Am I waking up in the wrong cycle of my sleep? I think we addressed this already. Try getting some exercise during the daytime. Can you define grains? What types of grains do you recommend? Good question. Um, we talked about whole grains. So the difference between whole and refined is that whole grains are more of the grains that that have not been processed. They are straight from, from nature, from how they're grown. So whole wheat are the whole wheat kernels. They really haven't done that much to them. The refined grains um, is when they have taken out the outer brown husky portion of the grain. And that husky portion is actually very nutritious and has a lot of fiber in it. So that's why we recommend not using the refined grains. And we know the reason why they do the refined grains is because it tastes better, so they need to sell more. But nutrition-wise, whole grains are better. And there's lots of examples. You can even Google whole grains. Um, there's, uh, there's whole wheat, there's barley, there's um, sorghum, there's um, brown rice. So just go ahead and Google and you'll see there's many, many different types of whole grains. Next question, is it okay to sleep with your cell phone next to you if it's been turned off or does it have to be in a different room? Good question. It's fine if your cell phone is turned off and it's, and it's right next to you. I don't think that would necessarily affect your sleep. The question you have to ask yourself are you okay with waking up in the morning and the first thing that you do is you reach for your cell phone? Because I bet that's the, the experience of most of us, including me. Um, I think we've all kind of been addicted to our, we've gotten addicted to our cell phone. So the question is, if you need to have, if you need to have a break from your cell phone, because you're so used to being on it all the time, then it might be a good idea to put it in a different room. But if you're okay with, uh, with how you are interacting with your cell phone, then just leave it next to your bed, that's fine. Besides what you have mentioned, what foods should I stay away from before I go to bed? For instance, I've heard we should avoid protein. That's a good question too. So what I talked about not eating about maybe at least two to four hours before you go to bed. And the reason is because you don't want your stomach continually digesting for a long period of time while you're trying to rest and sleep. Your body has a lot of things and your mind has a lot of things that it needs to do to restore you while you're sleeping. So you don't want to distract it by having all of the blood going to your stomach trying to digest. So what you eat makes a difference as far as how long it takes for your body to digest things. And protein is, is what takes the longest to digest. So it's good to have protein during the daytime because it gives you energy throughout the day. And it doesn't mean that you should avoid it at night but I would probably recommend having less of that and more of the lighter types of foods, um, like even soups, or you can put vegetables, fruit in there. So um, simple carbohydrates or carbohydrates in general are digested faster than proteins. Um, fats are digested, good, uh, good fats like avocados and things like that are, are digested faster as well. That's probably why you've heard to avoid protein. So they say, eat breakfast like a king, lunch like 
a queen. Maybe I'm forgetting that. And and dinner like a pauper, basically. So um, that's that's the reason why. Because if you if you eat less amount and lighter foods in dinner time, it it gives you the best chance to sleep better. And the last question. Oh, good. I'm so glad we we're able to get through all of them. Can I get the adenosine anywhere else besides exercise? That is a good question that I probably don't have the answer to off the top of my head. I will have to, I would have to look into that personally to see, but I'm wondering if your real question is, how do I have the appropriate hormones and neurotransmitters in my body, how can I get enough of those that will help me to sleep? Um, and if that is the original question, then the, the answer is um, all the tips that we have just mentioned because all of those things will help enhance your body with the right hormones and the neurotransmitters so you can sleep. Oh, we do have one more question. If you have a blue light blocker in your glasses and on devices, is that better? That's a great question. Um, I don't 100% know the answer to that. I would probably say I don't know what the percentage of blocking that these glass that these glasses and and devices actually does. My guess is that it probably cannot get rid of it 100%. So in that case, if you absolutely need to use these devices and you are using a blue light, you could even experiment and see how your sleep is the quality of your sleep when you wake up in the morning, how do you feel? Um, and I would also probably recommend that you, that you use these devices as the least possible because it's very true that you, you, you can still function and have a wonderful life without these devices for an hour before you go to bed. But if that's absolutely not possible, then see if you can limit it. And I believe, oh, there's one more. You guys are great with these questions. I feel rested if I get nine hours of sleep every day. Is that fine or does that fall under oversleeping category? Oh, that's a good idea. I think nine hours of sleep is fine, actually. Yeah, they do say seven to eight. If you're sleeping about 10 hours or 11 or more, you know, then, then I get more concerned with that. But nine hours every, every day is actually fine. I would not consider that oversleeping. I believe those are all the questions. I'm going to put my contact information up here. Um, there is the information for Brand New Day and Lifestyle Medical. And there's additional contact information for for both of us here. And now I will turn it over to Shayna. Hi. Yes, so if you're interested in um, making an appointment or a consultation with Lifestyle Medical, make sure you um, contact Dr. Pandit or you can go to their website or give them a call. And that um, contact information, like she just said, is right there. Um, and then for Brand New Day Insurance, if anyone is interested in uh, learning more, we have our phone number on the screen, 855 or 4208 or a website bnbhmo.com. There will also be an email that'll be sent right after this. So um, if you want to reply to that to get more information, we are a Medicare Advantage plan. And like I said at the beginning, we offer um, extra benefits beyond original Medicare, like unlimited transportation, dental, vision, hearing aids, uh, over-the-counter allowance, acupuncture, and so much more. So um, feel free to respond to the email um, or give us a call. Thank you so much. And there will be a recording of this. And um, I believe the instructions will be in that email as well if you want to rewatch it. So thank you to Dr. Pandit and Lifestyle Medical. And 
Um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. I believe there's one more question here, but I'm oh, yeah. not sure. Do you want me to answer it? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's similar, actually, the last two here. If you sleep for two to three hours and you wake up and you go back to sleep and then you wake up. Um, so is that okay? And that's, that is probably an indication that you're not getting good quality sleep. So I would recommend that you try to, I would be interested to see if you can incorporate these tips and see if that helps. And if it's still not helping, then talk to a provider, come talk to us, you know, schedule an appointment with us so we can, so we can see how to. All right, I think that's it. Thank you, Shana. Okay. Thank you to bye. Bye-bye.